We're going to get the lights while I set up this uh, clip from a movie called The Passion of the Christ. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you anything brutal. But I think that uh, um, they really capture what it might have been like for Jesus and his mom, what it was like for them to be together. Because Jesus lived a human life. And uh, he lived at home for 30 years, um, learned the art of, of carpentry from his dad. And so I think that um, this is really cool, and I want you to watch it. Uh, I think it shows the humanity of Jesus. Um, he wasn't some guy floating around in a white dress with a blue sash. He was a carpenter. Um, he had a good relationship with his mom. And uh, I would love, I, ho I hope when we get to heaven, that God will have like this detailed DVD biopic of Jesus growing up. Wouldn't that be cool? Because we're given so little in the Bible of when he's growing up. I would love to see that. Like, I'd love to see Jesus at five years old. Um, you know, what it would have been like. He'd fall and scrape his knee. Mom would clean the gravel out of his knee like moms do, you know. Um, you know, as a big brother, I'd like to see what he looks like. I'd like to see Jesus as a teenager. And when you think about him in those terms, you think about the fact that he had a real relationship with his mom. I think that that's probably a pretty great picture of what it could have been like. Another thing he did was he stuck around until he was 30 years old. Probably his dad died when he was in his late teens. And Mary and Joseph went on to have sisters and half-brothers of Jesus too. So I think he stuck around to take care of the family before he started his ministry. You can see how... He honored his mom in the scriptures, and that's why this sermon is called Jesus and His Mom. We probably don't usually think in those terms. But uh, when it comes to Jesus and his mom, there's a few things we can learn. The first thing is that uh, I think about who gave the command to honor our mother. Who gave that command? It was Jesus. Jesus gave the commandments. The Ten Commandments that were given to Moses were given by him. That's amazing when you think about it. So commandment number five is coming up on the PowerPoint here. Is uh, honor your father and your mother. So Jesus gave us that. Is the PowerPoint working, guys? Is it? Is it up and running? Okay. Honor your father and mother. There you go. Jesus gave that command. And so when it comes to that commandment, we have to understand that Jesus also modeled, modeled it with his life. And... Uh, do you know, this is a kind of neat trivia fact about the New Testament. His little brother James, his half-brother James, wrote the book of James in the New Testament. So when Jesus rose from the dead, James started believing his brother was God. You can imagine it might have been a little bit of a pill to swallow for James, right? Growing up. Yeah, I'm, I'm God with skin on. Uh-huh. That must have been tough for James, right? But when his brother rose from the dead, so James got to see his brother as not only Lord and Savior, but as a human being at home. I think that would have been really neat. And uh, Jesus would have been the best big brother ever. And actually, um, he was such a good big brother that when it came time to start his ministry, that I think it was hard for his brothers and sisters to believe in him as the Messiah because they had seen him. Now, if they'd stopped to think about it, they would have said, you know what, Jesus never lost his temper with me. He never was a bully. He never took rights over me and was a mean big brother. They probably didn't think of that. But it must have been hard for them to make that transition. He was probably the best big brother ever. And so I think you got to click on PowerPoint and give me control of it there, guys, just so you know. Now, Jesus told us to honor our mom and give her credit and take care of her mom, and he took care of Mary well. There's a few things we're going to look at in the Bible that, that prove that, okay? This is a picture of a little child examining his belly button. Now, we have belly buttons because we are derivative beings. Okay, Everybody's got one. I often ask myself, did Adam and Eve have one? I don't know. They came from God. They were just created. Maybe they're the only people in history that didn't have a belly button. But we do, right? Some of us as innies, some of us as outies. But what it means is we're derivative people. We're all derived from our father and our mother. We're not self-made. None of us are self-made. It's something we need to get in our heads that we owe everything to God and to our mom and to our dad. It's amazing when you stop and think about what your mother has given you. 
One of the privileges we all have is the ability to create. Your mom and dad got the ability to procreate you. And God gave us that power. And your mom fed, she had the shorter end of the stick when it came to the pregnancy thing, I think. Right? Would you agree? Yes, yes. You know, uh, you see a, a mom who's great with child, and you say, hey, when's the baby due? Two months. Oh. And you're like, yeah, they got the short end of the stick on that one. Right? And uh, when it's overdue, it's even worse, right? And you can just hear the groans. But uh, that's because it's a big job it is to carry a life. They don't get to eat what they want anymore, right? They, the, Their body is not their own. They, they share it. Women definitely um, work hard, and I'd say harder than most guys. And uh, think about this, cleaning up puke and then hugging us when we stink of vomit after. Oh, that's got to be tough, right? You know, all the details, getting up with, with night, calming our fears, cleaning up wounded knees, getting the gravel out while we're screaming at the top of our lungs, maybe hitting them. Oh, uh, baking 100 cookies on the 100th day of school. I've seen my wife do that. Like, that's a lot of work. They do it because they want to. Teaching us manners, guys, you can be thankful for that. Otherwise, you'd be a complete barbarian. Cooking for us relentlessly. Like, I can cook chicken nuggets and fries. Turn the oven on, throw them in there. You know, on a, on a kid's own night, when we both get home from work and we got like a half hour to eat, I can do that, right? But you don't want me cooking, cooking. I'll give you an example. A couple Mother's Days ago, I decided I was going to make potato salad for a Mother's Day picnic. So I put four or five eggs in the pot, turned up the water, went outside to work on my sermon because it was Saturday night. An hour and a half later, I came into the house and what is that smell? Right? Well, the eggs had gone down to nothing and exploded all over the kitchen and the ceiling and the stove. And it was an hour of cleanup, literally, I, I'm pretty sure. And it still stunk, you know, and oh man, that was bad. And then, so I, I put some more eggs on. And then I went outside to have a cup of coffee. And uh, I'd been out there for a while drinking my coffee. And my neighbor Pete comes over. Hey, what you doing? Oh, I'm just working on my sermon. <gasps> I run inside and the water is that much left. Those eggs were cooked. But at least they hadn't exploded. Right? This is why you don't want me cooking. And when these kind of things happen, I can't believe my wife's uh, lack of violent reaction. She's very steady. Right? And, and, you know, my mom is here. She could testify. Me and my brothers playing, um, making movies. Like Miami Vice was a big TV show when I was a kid. So we'd make our own Miami Vice movies. You know, I was Crockett. My brother was Tubbs. We had guns. And we'd get these, we'd get these Ziploc bags and put a bunch of ketchup in it. And when you got shot, you go, uh, and the ketchup would splurt. And it looked great on film. Mom would come home and open the front door and she'd be like, why is there ketchup all over the walls? You know, there's the patience of the woman to raise three boys. You know, not to mention, uh, dad gets saved and he gets out of the Air Force and now he's got to get his degree. So on Sundays, he'd preach at this little church in Springfield and drive like 120 miles to Toronto on Monday morning for school. And mom is there all week with three boys um, putting up with us while dad's getting his education. He would gladly say, this master's degree is hers because she earned it. And just that's what moms are like. Um, you saw maybe those posters. You should read them in depth. Salary.com does a survey every year to see what a mom is worth. There's two different posters. One is a working mom. One's a stay-at-home mom. And uh, they surveyed 8,000 moms to find out how much time they spend on their common tasks. And uh, it's something. You've got... Uh, I don't know why this isn't working this morning, guys. There we go. You got a CEO, and that's what a mom is. She makes sure the company's running good. You've you've got uh, daycare, twenty six thousand dollars. You've got a cook, twenty seven thousand a year, and this is this is not good money, right? You've got a psychologist. <laughs> Moms have to be psychologists, okay? You got to calm them down. You got to listen to their problems. You got to 
get them to eat, right? More than just you got a laundry machine operator and you've got you got a driver, a personal driver. Think about all that, right? It's just there's so much, and I think there's one more on there, but it adds you know you're the janitor, the cook. I mean, this is just scratching the surface, and a housekeeper might make twenty seven thousand a year, and that's not good money. You know, that's a lot of money a mom deserves, right? They work hard. So how did Jesus honor his mom? Next slide. Well, he set the example. Like I said, he didn't start his ministry till he was about 30 years old. Um, and that shows that he cared. Men were men by 12 in that culture. And he could have been out, you know, started his ministry at 15 because he was a son of God. But he stuck around. He lived a real life learning how to care for his family. And in John 2, I want you to turn your Bibles now to John chapter 2. He also demonstrated his honor for his mom. She was uh, key in the first miracle that Jesus ever did. John 2 verse 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Like, moms see a problem, right? Son, you got to fix that. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus said, My hour has not yet come. Jesus wasn't, I think, planning on that miracle. God knew it was going to happen. Jesus lived by faith like us. His mother said to the servants, just do whatever Jesus tells you. It's that whole mom, well, you're just going to do this because it needs to be done, right, kind of thing. And Jesus is like, I guess I'm fixing this. It's, it's a superpower moms have. You know, I, no, I wasn't going to do a miracle yet. Well, they need, they need some wine. So she had faith that her son could fix the problem. So it goes on. Nearby stood six Stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing. They're huge, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Mom told me to do this, so I'm doing it. Right? And now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you saved the best wine till now. And what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs which revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mom and brother and disciples. There he stayed a few days. His mom was crucial in that first miracle. I think that was kind of cool. And uh, I think that woman's intuition kicked in. And she knew that Jesus could help the situation out. And he honored her, I think, by taking her suggestion. And the party continued with the best wine anybody had ever tasted. Now, it wasn't grape juice, just so some of you teetotalers know that. It was really good wine. Okay. John 19. I'm going to get you to turn to John 19 for another example of how Jesus honored his mom. John chapter 19 is a quite a different situation. It's not a happy occasion. Jesus is dying. Here he honored her from the cross. And as he's dying, you can see in John 19 that he told John to take care of her from the cross. He said, woman, this is your son. In other words, mom, this guy's going to take care of you now. And he said to John, here is your mother. Jesus, you couldn't have blamed him if he hadn't thought of that from the cross. He was in agony. He couldn't breathe properly. He's bleeding to death. He's been beaten. He's in the worst torturous pain a human being could ever go through. And he's thinking about his mom. What does that tell you? That tells you that Jesus honored his mom. And he lived up to the command that he gave Moses thousands of years before. That this lady needed to be taken care of. So he commissioned John, the disciple, and it says that John from that day took her into his house. Jesus made sure his mom would be taken care of. And you know, our culture is very throwaway with a lot of things, right? You know, what if our moms had dealt with us when we were really sick 
the way that sometimes our culture deals with aging parents that are really sick. I was talking to a friend who took months off work to go be with a parent that was dying and to take care of them in their house. I thought that was fabulous because a lot of times it's shuffle them into some care facility or hospital and uh, I've seen dying parents where the kids just carry on with life as if it's normal and don't take extra time. Sometimes you have to work, I understand that, but I thought that was fabulous that someone would take time off work and make it work to love their parents and to give them all the honor and all the dignity they could in their last days. That's not normal in our society, which is a throwaway society, right? You know I'm right. And so if Jesus took care of his mom, we got to take care of our moms. If it means moving and getting a suite, you do that for as long as you can. If it means they're in a facility because they need the care, it means that you make sure you go and see them every day and you hang out with them if you can. Anything you can do, we do. We follow the direction of our Lord. Okay? Next slide. When you honor her, you honor him. Now, I know that uh, there's no perfect parents. And I know that there are some parents that have hurt us. Maybe some moms, um, moms generally speaking, are better than guys at loving. But if, if your mom has hurt you and um, you don't have a good relationship with them, what do you do? You honor her anyway because God made her and she made you. And you go and you do the best job you can of honoring her. It means if you don't feel like sending a Mother's Day card, you do it. If it means you don't feel like calling, you do it. Because when you honor the one that gave you life, you honor the one that gave her life and the one that gave you life ultimately. You can't separate the two. Um, they're inextricably linked. You love people, you love God. So if you take care of your mom and you honor her, you honor God. And if you if you don't, you dishonor God. You don't want to be doing that. I don't want to mess with her dad. You know, like all the boys in town pity my girls, really. Really. Small town. Everybody knows who I am now. Um, the boys of the high school know that if they mess with my girls, they'd be messing with me. Right? They just kind of, you know, I saw a couple of them the other day, and they kind of shudder when I walk in, and I'm like, that's not really the reaction I'm hoping for. but. Um, it's that whole old oh, pastor thing, right? And they don't know. But, you know, any of you dads would probably kill somebody that hurt your daughter if you could, right? That's, and I don't want to mess with the Lord by hurting and dishonoring another human being, especially your mother. A couple of exhortations for us. Moms, this is for you. I got a picture here with three batteries, three storage tanks. Bill Hybels came up with this, and I liked it. He says we have a spiritual, a physical, and an emotional tank, and the weeks drain them. And moms, uh, you might not be getting enough time with Jesus. You know, you might not have um, a plan to uh, to read. you got to start maybe just the beginning of the book of John and get a journal and write down what God's giving you. He can fill your tank back up spiritually. Maybe you're not getting enough chance to physically recharge your tanks. You're not getting to go for a walk. You're not getting to um, do any exercise, right? A 45-minute walk is like half a Valium, I heard. And on, on personal experience, if I go for a 45-minute walk after a long day, I feel much better up here. And emotionally, this is big for women. The toll is much harder on women than it is on guys in a lot of ways in this world. And so um, your emotional tank might be getting really drained. And what happens is when all three of those tanks get drained, you're really low. You're really low. And you might be doing your devotions every day, but you haven't done any exercise, so you feel really lousy. Or you might be doing your exercise, and you've done one thing after another that's emotionally drained you. You're not getting to do anything like go to a movie with a girlfriend or go out for a cup of coffee and talk. Or maybe your husband's been an idiot and he hasn't taken you for a walk and listened to you all week. 
right? You've got to get that emotional tank filled up somehow. So keep that in mind. Women, you need to take some time to refill these tanks. And guys, these are the tanks they have. And we should, kids, you got to work on this too. Okay? Um, I saw a tweet on Twitter. Anybody know what Twitter is? Okay. From Mark Driscoll. And he said this week... Uh, um, he got an email in his inbox. It said, blow her mind. And he said, I didn't open it, but I assumed it meant do the dishes and take out the trash. <laughs> I thought that was good. Like, wow her. Right? Get up. Kids, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this to you. When mom gets home at the end of the day, get up and go get her a nice cold glass of iced tea. Ask her, mom, is there anything I can do for you? Because she probably bought that shirt you're wearing. Right? A lot of moms have to work today. You know, um, when I was younger, one of the first things I should have done, you know what that whole hindsight thing is, right? Yeah. Wish I got my wife a car when she was young, when we were young with little kids. I took the car to work and left Sandra stranded at home. Yeah, real intelligent. Feel like a prisoner in your own house, especially in the wintertime, right? Um, there's things we could do to be thoughtful. I want you to listen to this by Chuck Swindoll. He wrote this in his book, The Grace Awakening. The cost of family life is higher for wives than for husbands and kids. When you're talking about good mental health and psychological well-being, men have it better every time. Most women do the giving, while the men continue to take. And the kids do too. The woman is the one who's more capable of compassion and support and being there when needed. It's like default and it kicks in. Men aren't very good at being in touch with that stuff. They're less capable of reaching out and making emotional contact. It's something men have to choose. It doesn't kick in naturally. But they're very capable of being able to take what a woman has to offer. And in doing so, men, we often take advantage. I thought that was very good for me to read. So let's not take advantage. Um, I know a lot of guys uh, in this church that do a good job of knowing when their wife needs a break. And they understand that babysitting the kids isn't babysitting the kids. It's taking care of them so she can have a break, right? You're the dad. You fathered them. You take care of them for a while. And and I really have admired some guys in the church um, who shut the TV off. And I see them going for a walk with their kids or giving their wife a night out. I saw Sean the other night, and he gave Monica a chance to go to softball without the kids. He took care of them so she could have a night away. I thought that was fabulous. Um, I, I saw some good advice uh, from an author. He said the first 25 seconds in the door at the end of the workday, guys, is the most important. You set the tone for the evening. Get home. I'm tired. I need to sit down and have a drink. Right? <laughs> Instead, how about walk in and say, honey, how are you? Can I get you a coffee? You wonder why she's icy at bedtime? When you get in, you're like, oh, I'm so tired. Right? Um there's a verse coming up here from the Ephesians. Okay? Jesus said this when he inspired it through the Apostle Paul. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering to God. So, talking to all believers here, men and women, children, we are to do what Jesus did. He gave himself up for us. That's what we get to do for each other. And then later on in Ephesians 5, you'll see verse 25. He loved the church by giving himself up for her. It's a picture of um, how husbands should love their wives. Give it up. Give it all up. You know, you can wait for that um, plasma TV that's bigger. It's going to be half off in a year anyway. And you can put some money into her. When I'm at a Christian bookstore and Sandra sees a book that she wants to read to help her grow in her faith, I'm getting it. I don't care if I have to not get my CD or whatever it is because I want her to grow. That's what Jesus did for the church. He helps us grow. He clothes us in radiance. We're supposed to do everything we can, guys, to help our wives grow in Christ. We're going to have to put some money into that. Send her to a conference. Next slide. And this is how the message puts Ephesians 5. 25 20 and I think it's great husbands go all out all out in your love for your wives exactly as Christ did for the church you loved marked by giving not getting 
So I think I think that there's some good encouragement for the guys. I think the hammer blows are almost done with you, gentlemen. Next slide. It's probably one more. Husbands, in the same way, way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat her with respect as a weaker partner. That means physically weaker and equal partner in inheriting life. Um, and we have to do that because it goes on to say that if we don't, our prayers aren't heard. Some guys are wondering why they're not being blessed, why nothing's working out for them at work. Maybe there's steel ceilings right now because of your stubbornness and the, the prayers are bouncing off because you're not being considerate to your wives. I think that's powerful stuff. Next slide. Top five needs of a woman. Affection, conversation. Apparently they speak almost twice as many words as us guys. So when you think you're out of words at the end of the day, you've done your 10,000 words. Probably got to come up with a few more to talk to your wife. Honesty. They want openness with you. And they want commitment to the family. When a guy comes home and he gets the quad out right away and he goes quadding and he doesn't spend any time with the kids, he doesn't sense that commitment to the family, right? That's important. Those things are important. Next slide. There is many students that graduate from high school and diplomas. And uh, there's one story of a young man at commencement, and uh, this mom who was a widow scrimped and saved, worked two jobs to provide for her son to go through college, and as God's diploma, the first thing he did was step off the stage and walk down the aisle to her and give her the diploma and say, Mom, you earned it. And that's thinking straight. So let's do the same for our mom, the way Jesus honored his, because they matter to God and they matter to us. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you that you've given us the grace of of, uh, of life. And uh, Lord, may we do a good job of honoring not only our moms, but our dads and each other. May we remember from Ephesians 5 there about how we're to be like you were for us. We want to be that to others. Thank you, Jesus, that um, we worship you today. And therefore, we want to honor our moms so that we honor you properly, Lord. We give you our praise, God. Thank you for the beautiful day. I pray that these folks would have a great Mother's Day and be able to hang out and encourage their moms, shower them with hugs and kisses and good food. In Jesus' name, amen.